I'm the chairman at Shropshire Mind. My other roles, as I, I'm a director of a training company and I specialise in consultancy around safeguarding mental capacity and mental health. So the things I bring to bear here are from experience uh, working around three or four different trusts and also a multitude of either private or sector related care or health and care providers that we've got out there. Um, Siobhan touched on and pinched my one. Mine was going to be the seventh C. Now mine's going to have to be the eighth C as I start to bring another one into this, uh, which is candor. And now candor is something they start to bring in uh, specifically when we look at the government response to the Francis report. And there's lots of us that can look back to that and think, is it a headstone we're looking at? Is it something? Actually, it's a good benchmark that we start to move on from and we can start afresh from this point. But again, that's also about a reasoning and an understanding and acceptance, the fact that something was not quite right with where we were and start to move on in a really good and forward looking uh, way. Candor and the way they express it in there is a way of being open, honest and frank. They may regret us asking us to be that way, uh, but that is exactly how it should be. Could I have a quick show of hands? Who here thinks it's easy to whistleblow or talk out as it currently stands now? Well, nobody. That is a, and that's probably as realistic as where we are. And that tells us that something has to change at some point because it is nigh on impossible. And I'll share with you, I certainly uh, stood up and uh, whistle blew um, and stood up when there was deaths being covered uh, or covered up uh, within an organization. Was it easy? No, it was awful. Did I have to leave? Yes, I did have to leave. I can look at myself in the mirror afterwards, but actually we shouldn't have that awful experience. It should be something that we require the courage to do, but we should have the courage of our conviction and support of whoever's there with us to allow us to go through that process and actually have the confidence to do so. Um, to start to go through here, I'm a bit of a mover. I tend to pace up and down, so I'll try and root myself on the spot as we go through this. Uh, I like to start off with courage here. With a dictionary definition, it's always a baseline level to start at. It says here, courage is the ability and willingness to confront fear, pain, danger, uncertainty or intimidation. I would certainly say this is an area that concerns us within here. However, there's also something here called moral courage and that, that's an important aspect for us to have a look and focus upon. And it's the ability to act appropriately in the face of popular opposition, shame, scandal or discouragement which is one of the key areas we start to look at. Um, lots of people will sit there and they will get in the crowd. They want to be in with those, but actually standing out ahead of those is pretty hard. And it can be uncomfortable at times. And certainly as we start to look at courage as a nurse leader, it can feel very isolated. Even though we know we're leading there, it's pretty nice to feel as though you're actually included within everybody else's reasoning as well. And we're not just sitting there as some kind of person trying to row against the tide that's going in the opposite direction. He's a bit of a hero of mine. Uh, he's probably never going to be the Archbishop of Canterbury because he's outspoken, but we need characters like this. And Dr. Uh, John Santamu, the Archbishop of York, warned the government has now reached a moral crossroads where, and it must decide whether to build a society that supports the vulnerable or one where individuals face whatever life throws at them on their own. And that's quite a clear statement. And what it does show is we can speak up and we can actually change things. As a result of this statement and in putting it out there, the government came on the radio the next day and stated, we need to get people out there to support older people in the community who are isolated. So community is certainly a key aspect we start having there. Now it's our seventh C and not our eighth C. Midstaffs in the Francis report, again for lots of people, will be sitting looking at this uh, and my background and specialisation is in the safeguarding area, the Mental Capacity Act and everything that sits around this and it was a, certainly a key focus on this area and the neglect that was taking place. Uh, whether you define it as abusive practice or anything else, it was primarily neglect that was taking place. But it also started to bring to bear the fact that people need to be accountable in order for us to have the courage to speak up Actually, we have to have accountability in there, which is another key essence. Um, a lot of this has started time before the Francis report. Winterbourne View and the Serious Case Review. Everyone aware of Winterbourne View, the Panorama program? Um, and that, obviously, CQC is now reversing and starting to really bring and hone down on the standards as a result of lots of things from there. So prior to the Francis report actually being launched and being upon us, Winterbourne View, Serious Case Review, started to bring to bear the fact that corporate accountability was not there in the health and social care sector. 
that manager that holds the funds and cuts the staffing down to a, an unacceptable level will not be found accountable in the same manner as those of you who are on the coal face. And it's an important change that we've started to see, and it is a positive. The Francis report has started to propose, or the government's response is the new uh, crime of willful neglect which they're proposing to bring in so that we can have corporate accountability so everybody is in this together and that is the way to move forward. In order to have that we need to benchmark and move forward appropriately. So in order for us to command respect we need the courage to stand up for our professional values and it is those professional values that are going to guide us through. Um, we certainly as we start to look at this, the, the NMC, um, the Royal College of Nursing, the GMC are all looking at their codes of conduct, co uh, professional codes of practice that they've got within there, and they're going to start to redefine some of those based upon the report and the government response to this. And the government has accepted that all of those need to come into play. As you've said before, though, it, you liken it to moving Titanic. I liken it to trying to redirect an oil tanker. You may turn the wheel. It's going to take about three or four miles down before we start to change the course and direction. But it's that positive change that we do now and having the courage to do so that is going to enable us to steer that wheel and have that positive course for the future. Uh, unless you read the Daily Mail. Anybody read the Daily Mail here? Yeah, they're certainly not fans of ours at the moment. Um, somebody obviously offended somebody or the editor within there, but uh, it's about standing above those. If you ever feel down, read that. You'll feel better. Um, Disagreeing when standards are compromised, um, it's not easy, and it, it isn't easy. There are lots of people I come across when I do safeguarding training or um, anything around those areas or sectors, and they'll come forward and say, how do I speak up? Where will the support come from? And that is from us to actually start to lead from the front and actually show that you can make a difference by bringing that change in. And I'm certainly starting to notice more in the training sessions where people are coming in and saying, I did speak up, and somebody took notice. It, it's great that positivity is starting to come into this and holding the heads high. And it's how we cha challenge that bad practice. They've asked for candour. Candour will come then. Openness, frankness and the courage to speak out, which is a key part of everything we're going to be doing from the future. Um, poor training. The e-training e that you would said about bringing in that's effective as well. Training has to be effective. I can't tell you how many places I've worked, how many trusts, where they'll release staff for one day and they will do all of their mandatory training and everything else within that one day, and I come in at the end and I get 40 minutes, and they're like, ah, absolutely just tilting off already. It's got to be there to change, because if you don't know the new acts that are coming in, how we apply them, the updates, how can we be competent or confident to have the courage and stand up and lead? And that is a really important fact. It's not just to blow the trumpet of training. Things are changing so quickly we need to have that scope or have that feel and know exactly where we're coming from in order to lead effectively. Quality control and short-staffed. Is it easy to speak out about these? Anybody? It's not, is it? And it's how we can be more effective when we disagree as well. When they're asking for candour and openness, it is about trying to communicate. I'm not trying to step into somebody else's realm here, another sea. It is about communicating effectively. Happiness and feeling good in the workforce is a key element of this because by having that good feel or the good team spirit in there, you can speak up openly and you can be abrupt when you need to because they know there's a need for that at that point. Changing to a supportive and learning environment is what it's all about. And the more we can do that, the more people will enjoy coming into work and feel they're actually making that positive change every time they come in, rather than thinking it's that culture of silence which has been there and it's been endemic for quite some time as well. So what does it mean to you? Courage. There's a few inspirational people uh, that we can look around. Certainly one that's of note now. I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he, he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers the fear. So it's not just about the physical courage or anything else, the moral courage and actually the courage of your convictions as well. Um, Winston Churchill, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen as well. And sometimes as nurse leaders, we're going to have to have the courage to sit there and listen to somebody else as they feed it back and actually take it on, as long as it's constructive in its uh, way it's delivered to us. How few there are who have the courage, uh, to get, uh, courage enough to uh, own their own faults or resolution enough to mend them. And that may lead 
on directly from the Winston Churchill one, because sometimes we're going to have to own up to those. That is, again, part of us leading from the front. And it's so easy to stand with the crowd, to be one of them, but it does take true courage to stand alone for what is right by you. This is yours to own. It's not anybody else's. And by having that courage, what we can do is then stand up and say we were effectively safeguarding those who are too vulnerable to stand up and look after or speak up for themselves because we're guardians of those people who are vulnerable, cannot communicate effectively, or those who are taken advantage of and don't feel they have the ability to speak up. So those who inspire us is quite a key element we all look within ourselves. It's easy to look out to everybody else, but looking at ourselves is a bit harder. And we've all lived with a life filled with different experiences, those who influence our value base. And you're certainly having your value base challenge now, things that are coming directly out as a result of all the reports. And it's certainly good to have that benchmark. And it's going to continue as well. When we look at the CQC intention for next year, they've certainly deliberated and give us a clear intention that a huge part of their inspection mandate is going to be about mental capacity and mental health. So they're going to start honing down in those specific areas to see that the skill set is there and that we've got those. Who inspires you then to have the courage and conviction to do what is right? I can't look into all your heads. I don't have the time to ask you the question directly. It's something you'll be thinking of. It could be somebody that sits on the world stage. The most uh, inspiring people we have, uh, such as Nelson Mandela, or a person we know personally. And that's my aim, is that we should know somebody that inspires us. Somebody personally, it doesn't have to be on a world stage. There are many people out there who change exactly what goes on, inspire us to do things. And there's certainly th people within the workplace. And it'd be nice to think that you're the person in that workplace that inspires others to know or to feel that they are valued and everything they do is valued. Look closer at those who surround us. We have truly inspirational people closer than you could imagine. And as it was covered before, you are the people who are already open to the change and are already changing because you're here, which is a huge part of this. Look closer, closer still. That inspirational leader is you. And I think there's time we need to look at ourselves and have an understanding that it is us that are the inspirational leaders that are changing everything and that are leading from the front and inspiring others to do so as well. And that's me. Don't know if I was too quick. No. You didn't do a five. No, no. <laughs> There's no time for questions. Mesmerized. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed.